Hello, and again, welcome to BitDepth. I'm Santiago Ramones. Across from me through the power of the internet is... BJ Mendelssohn. Cool. So, uh, who, who are you? What do you do? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I am probably the only person on planet Earth who can say they've worked as a mall Santa and <laughs> also spoke at the United Nations. <laughs> uh, so I am a, uh, a world-renowned speaker and author on the subjects of you know, privacy and social media and word-of-mouth marketing. And uh, more importantly, to me anyway, is I am also a comic book writer. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, so which of these things do you consider to be your sort of main thing that you do? I'm trying to push more into just the comics work. Uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I, <laughs> I'm starting the publicity push for uh, a national story of minor significance, which is a self-help comic book. Mm. Uh, and depending on how that goes, I'll, I'll either keep pushing on that front or I might have to go back and write another serious book. <laughs> right. Um, so I've been reading a little bit of uh, uh, Social Media is Bullshit. Um, okay. so I guess one of my usual starting questions is how did you start doing what it is that you're doing? But since you have kind of this varied range of mall Santa and, and speaker and comic book writer. So I guess, how did you get started? <laughs> I, I should mention, I also applied recently to, uh, to be the MC for uh, a pig racing contest. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad is not a fan of that idea, so I haven't pushed too hard on it. But uh, <laughs> so I guess you know the, the reason why I mentioned that is you know when I was a teenager, I wanted to be George Carlin, mm. and I realized very quickly just from you know I, I read every interview that he did, I listened to every interview that he did, and he was constantly saying you know the best way to be a good comedian is to get stage time and just keep doing it over and over and over again, right? And so when I was 18, I figured out, okay, I am going to uh, book concerts uh, because I'm too young to get into bars. Uh, <laughs> to be, you, know, like, you know, if you're in upstate New York, to be a comedian, you know, it's very state by state. But in New York at the time, uh, you had to be 21 and over to come in and perform at the bar. Right. The, the loophole was if you rented out the bar, you could do whatever you want. Sure. And so when I was 18, I figured out, okay, uh, so if I like book concerts and I pre-sell tickets along with the band, then we'll have money to put on a show and I can do my comedy and they can play their music. And so uh, that's what I did. I did like 55 of those up and down the <laughs> East Coast. Uh, but the thing is, when you're 18 years old, you don't really have a lot of money coming in. Uh, you're entirely dependent on like the internet to yeah. promote your stuff. And, and so that's really where all this started because I very early on was like on MySpace when it first came out, was on YouTube when it first came out, mm -hmm. was on Facebook when it first came out, like on and on and on. And so uh, through there, I, I just started getting contacted by people who were kind of like, hey, can you help me promote my thing using these web platforms? Yeah. And, and that's sort of how this whole ball got rolling. <laughs> um, so, I mean, do you even kind of consider yourself an expert in these fields or is it just more so that since you've been doing it long enough, because that, that is kind of what you were saying in the book, you, you've been doing it long enough that now people just ask you. Yeah. I think that expertise is a weird thing, <laughs> uh, especially in, in the humanities or any field where it's not technical, you know, where I can't like measure, uh, for example, so for, you know, for example, you're at a music school, right? Yeah. Uh, so I have a, a baseline to measure whether or not someone's like truly an expert in their specific instrument. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> whereas if like something that's more soft skilled, uh, like, like marketing, especially, <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any such thing as expertise. I think it, it's just, you know, putting in your reps and who's been do doing it the longest. And so I, I think that just by virtue of doing it since I was 18 years old, you know, I just turned 35. Uh, I, I, you know, I've been doing it longer than most people. And so I have a better idea of what works and what doesn't because of that. Yeah. Um, and then I guess going to the, the other side of, or one of the other sides of what you do, um, what made you want to write for 
comic books specifically, but also just writing at all? Uh, you know, so I wanted to be a writer really early on. Uh, my dad was a school teacher in the Bronx for about almost 40 years, and he was an administrator. Uh, and I, I mentioned that because he there was always books all over the house. You know, like I was in elementary school reading Tom Clancy books. <laughs> uh, so, which is not like the, the best thing for someone in the sixth grade to be right. reading uh, for a lot of reasons. But <laughs> uh, pretty early on, I was like, okay, you know, I, I kind of get this. I, I, I think I can do this for a living. <laughs> so I, want to, I wanted a creative outlet. And so I took the writing. And uh, in high school, I had a website go viral uh, in like the organic sense of something going viral, not <laughs> right. you know, in the way, in the way that like, if you post the cat picture and it <laughs> blows up and you know, the next thing you, you tweet out has maybe like two responses to it. Sure. Uh, that's what I mean when I say like go viral. <laughs> so, uh, I had a website that blew up and everyone said it was really funny. So, uh, I just kept at it and that's really what, what kept me going was I realized that I can entertain people mm. by being a writer. Yeah. Um, and I mean, now you've written some books and they're published, but then uh, also with uh, comic books specifically, uh, I feel like, I mean, since probably since the beginning of comic books, it they've never been actually taken seriously as a medium. So uh, <laughs> what what makes comic books special to you and what makes you want to write for them? Uh, there's... It- there's just multiple ways I can answer this. I'm trying to decide like which one. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you, you two things. The first is that I think in terms of where we are today culturally, that the, the stigma that used to be attached to comic books, is it, it's still there, but it's yeah. faded. Uh, <laughs> because it used to be like when I was growing up in the 90s, pretty much every journalist, uh, regardless of what media platform they were writing about when they talked about comics, there was always some headline like, oh, comics ain't for kids anymore. And, <laughs> right. Or like, or like, zing, biff, pow. Uh, <laughs> so I got, so like, they, were, they were always trying to be cute. Yeah. Uh, and tie it into like the really can't be Batman. That, that doesn't really exist anymore because yeah. people people my age are now taking editorial positions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're not just the writers anymore. We're starting to move up the corporate food chain. Mm-hmm. So uh, because of that, you, you've got people who are kind of like, you know, I, re- I grew up reading comics. And watching professional wrestling, like Bill Simmons is a good example. Like Bill Simmons is a huge pro wrestling fan, but now because he's got producing power, he's able to make like these world class documentaries on Andre the Giant <laughs> on HBO. And when it comes out, we don't treat it like oh, it's a pro wrestling thing. We treat it like oh, this is like a prestige documentary mm-hmm. that just happens to be a pro wrestler. So I, I yeah. think that you know we're getting to a point culturally where these things have less of a stigma. The other thing is that, you know, I have a niece who is Chinese. Uh, she's bilingual. And so I, I like the idea that, you know, comics are almost universal mm-hmm. to, to a certain extent, uh, depending on, I mean, like if it's comedy based, it might be depending on how specific the comedy is, it might not translate. But <laughs> for the most part, you know, comics are a medium that are, that's global, that regardless of what language mm-hmm. you speak or where you're from, it's something you can look at and, and kind of enjoy and get into. And uh, we see examples of that all the time, like Attack on Titan, Yeah, uh, at least for the first season before it got too up its own butt <laughs> with, with its mythology, which is what happened in the comic. And I was kind of concerned that would happen in the cartoon as well. Mm. Um, you know, like Attack on Titan, the first season was a worldwide phenomenon. Mm. But that you know, that was something that in a lot of respects was very Japanese. I mean, they're in a, world, a walled off city, uh, which is a lot like Japan, where, you know, it's like completely, you know, it's, it's a very it's an uh, island. <laughs> right. It's an island. So and then structurally, like it, it's, there's a lot of homogeny. So. Mm-hmm. Um, or, and so that allows for like, so like in Japan, if you were to make a joke, uh, what's cool about it is that you could just point to someone's pants and because there's so much homogeneity within the society, uh, they will know what joke you're referring to huh. and, and they will laugh <laughs> and they will find it hilarious. So that's from a book called, uh, I think it's called the humor code hmm. if I'm not mistaken, but uh, but they took something that was very that was very specific to their culture, and it became like this this worldwide hit. And so, yeah. uh, I think that comics allow you to do that in a way that you really can't with just the written word. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is also like another layer to comics that I mean, 
yes, nowadays we have these gigantic blockbusters like Infinity War that are based on comic books, but you right. know, you, you still have graphic novel experiences the the anti superhero comic like uh, Watchmen, or even just I don't even know how to describe Mouse, uh, <laughs> but right. uh, so th- there is a, a range of uh, stories that you can tell through comic books. So, what is sort of what is it that you're going for with your uh, writing and in in comic books? Well, so there's really there's two, three sort of comics that I'm working on. I say three sort of because I just did a preview <laughs> for the third one. I haven't really. Uh, pushed it too much but one of them is just a straight up superhero adventure and it was really just my way of writing something that I just enjoyed mm-hmm. you know, I, I grew up with that stuff so I thought it'd be fun to actually do it uh, and, and see what the response was but the other thing was you know I, self-help is something that I started to research for my third book or fourth technically because I goes through the book mm-hmm. uh, and, and I realized that like Everything that's, that that needs to be said in the self help genre, genre has been said already, mm-hmm. but it hasn't necessarily been said in a comic book format. Right. Uh, and I thought that that was really interesting. And so, because comics allow you to to really do anything you want, yeah. I was like, what if we did a self help comic book? And I don't know if it's the first. I'm sure someone has had the idea before, <laughs> but uh, it's. I, I think that what I'm doing is one of the earlier versions or one of the earlier works in the field of like self-help comics. And so I was interested in seeing what I could do with the medium and, and how, uh, cause like, for example, in, in the national story of minor significance, what it, what it allows me to do instead of just telling you an anecdote and then telling you, uh, what you should learn from that, which is the basic format of every self-help book. Cause it, mm. it's from the Bible, uh, the Sermon on the Mound, which is what they're basically copying. Hmm. Like I could literally go inside my own head and show you like a visual depiction of like baggage, you know, <laughs> of, like stupid stuff that I'm holding on yeah. to from like high school. Uh, and I can show you that on the page of a comic book and, and visually you get something that you can understand quickly as opposed to me spending pages describing it. So that's, mm-hmm. that's really interesting to me. And that's sort of what, what drew me to doing that sort of thing with uh, a national story of minor significance. Yeah. Um, so, and then I guess, again, trying to go through all the things that you are attached to. Um, so I, I never grew up, uh, watching wrestling. Uh, sure, yeah. and so I don't, I don't understand it. You know, like there, <laughs> there's yeah. from an outsider's point of view, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. right. Um, so, so how would you explain wrestling to an outsider to make them be like, "Oh, okay, I, I can see why people like this." Well, there's a couple. There's a couple of ways, right? So the first is that, and the first, and I've noticed people echoing this talking point. So I'm kind of excited because I was one of the first <laughs> people. To, I'm not saying I was the first, but I was one of the first <laughs> people uh, who was saying that pro wrestling is just a live action comic book. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and in a way. <laughs> once you once you look at and then. There's, there's, there's some shows that embrace that. There's like Lucha Underground, which is the most ridiculous <laughs> of the different American wrestling shows that are on the air because it's a, it's taken the Mexican Lucha Libre style uh, and it makes it look very cinematic. Mm. Like it's almost like a Quentin Tarantino film that just so <laughs> happens to have wrestling as a part of it. Uh, and so th- there's that aspect to it where I just say it's a live action comic book. And once you can look at it that way, you realize, oh, OK, this isn't like a pretend sport. <laughs> you know, it, it's a story. It's a yeah, drama. Yeah. It, it just so happens to take place within a wrestling ring. The second way to look at it is that it, it's one of it's a very unique American institution. Yeah, uh, yeah. It traces its lineage to like the 1890s, probably a little earlier than that. Uh, it, it's it's embedded in the culture so much that Abe Lincoln was a wrestler. Mm. Like he wasn't a professional wrestler, but like he was. <laughs> He was into wrestling. That was like a thing that, sure. that people were into. So you can tell the story of uh, America through the story of professional wrestling, uh, so much so that even though I, I despise the current president of the United States, you know, that's <laughs> someone who who got famous in part through their participation yeah. in professional wrestling. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a governor who also got elected through professional <laughs> wrestling. And so it's just as if you look at it like as an art form, uh, it's something that's distinctly American. 
mm-hmm. uh, in, in the way that few things are, you know, like jazz. <laughs> and, and so that's that's another way to, to come at it and be like, okay, I kind of get this. Like, it, yeah. it's like a goofy, silly thing, but it's, <laughs> it's unique to this country. Uh, another way that I've heard it described, it's sort of like, it's a soap opera with, with fighting in between. Yeah. Um, or um, uh, Max Landis's uh, uh, Wrestling Isn't Wrestling. I don't know if yes. you've seen that. Um, yes. But that, that was a great way of, of sort of understanding for me to, to sort of see like, okay, I see why, you know, there's, there's wrestling nerds and it's sort of, <laughs> it, right, it know, makes sense. If you're a writer... I mean, just put aside that it's professional wrestling for a second. <laughs> right. There's no other medium where you can continuously tell the stories uh, of both a real person and the performer <laughs> and watch as those two things intersect and change over the course of like 20 years, mm-hmm. which is what Max Landis was pointing out. Yeah. You know, he, he was showing you the continuum of, uh, of Triple H's real life <laughs> career and story career. And that that's that's very unique. Like that's not mm-hmm. something you can easily reproduce in other forms. I mean, if you tried to do that in a comic book, it would be really confusing. Right. Yeah. You know, like if you tried to do it in the movie, it would be really confusing to the point <laughs> where you would lose a lot of the audience. But mm-hmm. in professional wrestling, you're able to to tell this long ongoing story in, in a very unique way, which which I'm fascinated by. Yeah. Um. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I like to talk about a lot is sort of uh, making progress through whatever it is that you do. And so uh, in uh, Social Media is Bullshit, you kind of talked about some of the like mistakes that you've made over time. And so a lot of times, since I do have a lot of musicians on the podcast, I ask about like musical hurdles, what's something that you've been learning to do. But I guess it's sort of difficult to... <laughs> conceptualize how how to become a better musician but also becoming a better uh podcaster or writer what's been a let's start with writing what's been a writing hurdle for you i think just understanding that there's nothing that's going to happen short term Hmm. Uh, i i think for a long time we allowed the the social media gurus and hucksters that tell you, you know, you just got to hustle and cash in on your passion and grind and grind, grind, right. grind, uh, and you'll see results. And uh, you might not see results for like a decade. Sure. You know, and I think that that's a very hard thing for people first to realize because especially, I, well, I shouldn't say it's an American thing because it's very, it's more a Western thing uh, where we're, because I used to walk around saying it's an American thing and then I traveled and heard in uh, in Russia, and then there was people from Brazil, and then there was people from the United Kingdom that all kind of told me the same thing. So, uh, I, I guess in the West, you know, we're we've become increasingly conditioned to instant results mm-hmm. and instant gratification. So, uh, and a lot of the advice that we get is, you know, if you work hard, you'll see results. But sure. it's not really the case. Like it's you work hard, and maybe. <laughs> maybe someday out of the blue an agent will contact you and say i like your stuff i would like to sure. find you Which, and that's what happened to me you know i was writing funny stuff on the internet from 1998 to <laughs> 2000 let's say 2009 mm-hmm. and then out of the blue dan mandel from sanford j greenberger emails me and he's like you're really funny i'd like to work with you mm-hmm. uh yeah you know, but i couldn't but i but if you look at it objective like if you look at it yeah, objectively, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have gotten to the point where I was good enough for him to invite me to work with him. Sure, yeah. Had I had I not kept at it, mm-hmm. you know, like had I started, because what happens is a lot of people just quit. Like for podcasts in particular, you can see this where there are tens of thousands of podcasts, no exaggeration, right? That that started and then gave up after like three months. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like they just get, or maybe six months, like they just gave up and walked away. Mm -hmm. But by continuing to work at it, you're becoming better and better every day. You just don't see it. Right. Uh, But I realized that putting in that work over, like if I showed him my work from 1998 or even 2004, (laughs) there's no, there's no way he would have worked with me. Sure. You know, but because I kept at it, because I kept publishing every day, 
uh, I, I got to the point where I was highly skilled at, at writing, at writing a certain way, and that's mm-hmm. what attracted them. So I think that's that's the hurdle. Yeah, is people give up too soon or too quickly, and they just don't realize that it's a long journey. And uh, you know, like Louis Black was on uh, Deuce, uh, Deuce and Romero, I think their names are mm-hmm. on Vice. Uh, I can't remember the other guy's name, but uh, Louis Black was on there, and he's like, you know, I didn't make any money until I was forty. Yeah, <laughs> and, I kind of, uh, and when he said that, I was like, you know, that's I'm I've heard this over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah. Like George Carlin was broke for a really long time. Mm-hmm. He went broke twice, in fact, because he owed the IRS like millions of dollars. <laughs> uh, and by being broke, that's what pushed him to do the HBO specials and to constantly mm-hmm. get on the road. So I think people need to just understand how long this stuff actually takes to pay off, if it ever pays off at all. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make a mental note of that for us to discuss later, but, uh, right. um, yeah. And then, so talking about like sort of your, your passions, uh, what is, what is your favorite part about, um, I mean, you talk about wanting to make people laugh, uh, but that's different because you're, you're a little bit separate from, uh, the the stand up point of view, which which is again a, a sort of instant gratification sort of thing. You tell a joke and then the people laugh, but right. you you have the the wall of of writing something and then just kind of eventually later you find out that people laughed. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, like that's been a weird. That's always been a weird thing. Uh, like I'll get people who are just now reading social media is bullshit mm-hmm. uh, who will text me about a joke that I wrote uh, like in 2011. <laughs> so, it's, sure. so it's not, it's not quite a decade yet, but like the joke is old enough where I don't remember, don't remember it. Right. Yeah. And then I'm like, wait, did I say that? Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I just completely, uh, yeah, like it, it's a little strange work, especially in comics and in books, books mm. in particular is incredibly slow. Uh, I will get back to doing stand up. I know I've been saying that for a long time now, <laughs> uh, but I haven't been in a place where I, I can make the transition easily mm-hmm. until recently. So now I feel like I can start uh, doing that again. But yeah, it is a little tricky to to write a joke and then not hear the punchline for like 10 years later. <laughs> right. Uh, but you know what? It's rewarding because what it tells me is that, you know, I read uh, just in the past three months, I've gone through about 32 books or so. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I'm probably only going to remember like two of them. Sure. Like, like realistically, I'm only going to remember two of them. Mm-hmm. So for someone to message me 10, almost 10 years later about a joke that I wrote. Yeah. Uh, that's great. <laughs> I'll take yeah, it. Yeah. I, I'm totally fine <laughs> with that. Um, what is, I guess, your, your favorite part about making people laugh or smile? I realized that that's sort of all, you know, so I, I should back up. I'm, a, I'm an atheist. Mm. And so I, I always tell people I'm an, I'm an atheist who loves Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and so what that means is I think Jesus was a pretty cool guy with a lot of good things to say. Mm. I, I just don't buy into like, you know, the, the, um, the, the very spiritual aspects that, sure. that go, go with that. Um, and I, I think that's important to mention because I, I, I find a lot of atheists to be antagonistic. Uh, mm-hmm. wrong, wrongfully so. Uh, I don't quite understand why they're so antagonistic, to be honest. You know, I think religion <laughs> is wonderful. Um, but I mention that because I, I, you know, I, I have a very practical outlook on life, uh, which is the only real reason that we're here is to make the world better for the next generation. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's our purpose. That's our whole mission. And mm-hmm. as long as we're doing that, that's great. Uh, and you know, sometimes we don't do that, like electing certain people president. Right. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> we do that great by making people laugh. And so mm-hmm. I, I decided that, you know, the world can be chaotic and random and it's, it can be messy and there's things that you don't control. So, uh, my way of helping people deal with that is just by making them laugh their ass off. Yeah. And <laughs> if I can do that, then I've done a good job as a fellow human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> um, sort of, I don't know if it's like sort of air related, but either way, uh, 
I have lived in Oklahoma for most of my life. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, what is it like to be in New York and sort of work in New York and live there and all the other whateverness of? So, <laughs> which part? Because I've lived all over New York. I lived on the Canadian border. I lived in Buffalo. I lived in the Capital Region. Uh, I lived in the Hudson Valley, which is, and then I lived in uh, New York City. So, and I was born on I was born on Long Island. So, like, I am a true blue. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. New Yorker. <laughs> uh, New York. When you leave New York City, is definitely a red state. Uh, <laughs> I think people don't quite understand that because um, hmm. I found that. Like, I found when I used to live in Glens Falls, and then I was like in Missouri for whatever reason because I've I've traveled all over the country at this mm. point. And they'd be like, hey, so what's what's New York like? I'd be like, well, what part of New York are you talking about? Sure, yeah. Uh, and they would just think the city. But then you would be like, well, no. You know, like once you leave the Holland Tunnel, like the world ends. You know, like yeah. It becomes, uh, well, that's the joke I always tell people is that the second you leave the Lincoln Tunnel, they, New Yorkers think the world ends. <laughs> yeah, because it's like a completely different Yeah, planet. exactly. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch the interplay between New York and then like New York, you know, like New York City. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm assuming you're talking specifically about New York City, though. Uh, I suppose, yeah, but it, okay. it is important to to highlight the difference between just, I mean, all of the neighborhoods and the titles for every different place that becomes its own culture, basically. Yeah, you know, what's, I'm fascinated by how different the people are in mm. different parts of New York. Like, if you go north past Albany, they're very, very much of New England. Mm-hmm. They they don't quite have the accent <laughs> that people think when you think of New England, but uh, their attitudes and mentality is, are much closer to as if they were from Massachusetts mm-hmm. than if they were from like New York City. Um, but if you go to Western New York, Western New York is fascinating because it, it it's so like I, I don't know if you're a sports fan, but <laughs> they love their sports teams. Mm. Like they have a deep spiritual love for the Buffalo Bills and for the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> And I can't quite explain to people not from Western New York what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but it's fascinating because that's that's like the center. Of, and every, it's everyone. It's not it doesn't matter what color you are, what what how rich you are. Like mm-hmm. if you are a Western New Yorker, you are a fan of the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo <laughs> It's like to a person. Uh, and, and that's sort of the center of the universe. And then New York is, you know, as in New York City is sort of like this weird beast. Uh, that's that's always changing. You know, like right mm-hmm. now it's changing because it's becoming a it's becoming a richer and richer city. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my mom and dad, uh, my mom was born and raised in Brooklyn. My dad was born and raised in the Bronx. My grandparents were Bronx residents their whole life. And my grandparents on my mom's side uh, were Brooklyn residents for most of their life until they went out to Long Island, as did most Americans, because uh, Long Island was the first suburb after mm-hmm. World War II. So they were part of that that uh, wave of of movement, but yo, know, like in a lot of respects, I'm, you know, they're true blue New Yorkers. And so <laughs> the New York city for uh, my mom and dad is completely different of the New York city that I had. Mm-hmm. You know, like it used to be, um, when I first started going into the city when I was little, uh, when, when I was little, but when I was probably closer to your age, my parents would be like, Oh, don't go on the subway. <laughs> you know, like this, the subway is scary. And don't, sure. go, don't go, don't make eye contact. And it's horrible. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, my generation is I'm a New Yorker of the 9-11 generation. Sure, so yeah. So I distinctly remember New York City before 9-11 and New York City after 9-11. And mm-hmm. after 9-11, it became a much friendlier place. Yeah. Uh, you weren't, um, you didn't have that don't make eye contact thing Yeah. Uh, that you had prior to 9-11. You had, oh no, we're all in this together. We just went through something really traumatic and... Uh, if someone drops something, you're, you will stop, you know, you will stop and yeah. help them. Or if a tourist has questions, you will stop and help the tourist um, as opposed to just walking by them. And then now the New York City for my my niece, Olivia, uh, who's four now and she's living in Queens. Mm. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be like um, yeah. because people are getting priced out. And mm. so you have people getting priced out to the edges. And so she's like in Flushing. Uh, and before that, she was in Diker Heights in Brooklyn. But, you know, is she going to have the same experience I had? Probably not. You know? yeah. So it's hard to describe New York City for that reason because it's, it's, it's ever changing. Yeah. Um, 
Well, no, I think it's really cool how uh, how so much can be contained in, I guess, such a small space. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's history. Yeah, uh, for for myself, it's uh, everything's thirty minutes away. Right, and that's most, that's true for most of America. I think <laughs> one of the things I'm very I, that I was spoiled by uh, was mass transit. Mm-hmm. Uh, except for when I was living in like Potsdam on the Canadian border, because there was only like one bus and it took 13 hours for that one bus <laughs> to wind its way slowly through the Adirondacks, making all these stops just to get to, uh, Potsdam. But yeah, like the, the thing that New Yorkers are spoiled by is mass transit and how close <laughs> yeah. things are, because if you go to New Mexico, uh, for you to go to Albuquerque to Roswell, you're mm-hmm. spending hours on the interstate. Like right. there's nothing. Like if you're going, if you're in Texas, going from Houston to Austin and Houston yeah. to San Antonio, there is there's nothing. Yeah, uh, and that's that's most of America. That's Nebraska. Like if you're going from Omaha to Lincoln, <laughs> which is not that long of a drive, mm-hmm. like, there's nothing out there. Uh, so yeah, like I'm I'm deeply familiar with that. Yeah, I yeah. think that I think that we like it's easy. You know, I've made I've made jokes about Trump. Uh, because he, you should make fun of him. Uh, <laughs> but I've also, one of the things that I think is worth mentioning is that because we live so far from each other in the country, it's hard to get a good read yeah. on where, where we're all at. Mm-hmm. Um, because you can, you can find within different communities, different attitudes about different, different politicians sure. uh, in, we all within the same state. And that's because the country is so big. Yeah. And one of the nice things about the internet is, uh, if you are part of a fringe community, if you're if you're an atheist like I am, or you're a uh, LGBTQ ally like I am, you know, like mm. you didn't have a lot of people to talk to prior to 1992. Sure, you know, and now then you had Netscape and then you had AOL and uh, the internet kind of allowed the country to come closer together. And so, but yeah, like it's that distance thing is something we don't often think about, right? Um. I guess sort of last thing on this half of the podcast. Um, what advice do you have for people who are trying to uh, get to at least some sort of level where you are to where uh, people know who they are and buy their things? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how do you get known, right? Yeah. Uh not famous. I know Mark Schaefer wrote a book called Known, and one of the things he talks about is we're not talking about fame, or we're not talking Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie. We're talking sure. known to the point where, oh, I know who that guy is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like uh, Kevin Smith is kind of the barometer, <laughs> uh, or even less so. Like, like Mark, uh, I don't know if you listen to his podcasts. Uh, he he does he does a lot of podcasts. He does a lot of talking, but mm. uh, the best podcast he has is. Fat Man on Batman, where he has Mark Bernard as his co-host. Hmm. And, and Mark Bernard was one of those guys where I had read his stuff for years in the LA Times and the Hollywood Reporter and, and all the other places that he used to write, but I mm-hmm. didn't know who he was yeah. until he until he became uh, the co-host mm-hmm. on Fat Man on Batman. And then I was like, oh, I know who that guy is now. And so now when I, you know, I'll actively look for his stuff. So that's that's what I think we're we're talking about here. It's like that level of, you know, I know who that guy is. So I yeah, you know, yeah. He, uh, he he wrote uh, the comic genius. Hmm. So like once I once I m- made the connection of oh that's the same Mark Bernard in the rights for the Hollywood Porter. That's that's Kevin Smith's co-host. Sure. I'm gonna go and read all his stuff. And so I went <laughs> and bought Genius, and uh, uh, he also did the Highway Men, which they're making into a movie. So how do you get there? Uh, the the trick is to pick one thing and and this will sound like it's easy advice but it's not i promise you it's not the the trick to it is picking one thing that has a large enough audience behind it Mm -hmm. and at the same time that you're focusing on being very good at that one thing you're building up a network within that community so like Mm -hmm. right now i'll give you a great example i am writing uh, that comic I mentioned, you know, I said I mentioned three and a half comics. Mm. Uh, the half comic is called <laughs> Jobbers, which is a comic about women's professional wrestling. And so mm. what I've done is starting from zero, because I don't know anyone in the women's professional wrestling community. Sure. Uh, I've started following all the wrestlers and talking to them and 
you know, I started up a little talk show to, mm. to interview them and get to know them a little bit better. And at the same time, doing my research and writing the comic and making sure it's as good as can be. And if I do those two things long enough, uh, there will be a convergence where people will go, oh, BJ. Yeah, I, he was I was on his show. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. I heard uh, I heard Riley Shepard, who was on my show today. Mm. Uh, she's she's the what, oh, what is it? The, the geek goddess or the geek warrior shit i can't remember what it is uh she's awesome is what i'm getting at but like you know if you know who riley is but you don't know who i am the odds are good that you've gone and listened to the interview sure so now you know who i am so it's <laughs> honestly it's honestly it's that easy it sounds easy but mm. it's you just have to keep doing it yeah <laughs> um well awesome uh switching gears and you already kind of mentioned it a little bit but um uh my always uh, changing way of trying to segue into it. Uh, what is the role of spirituality or religion in your life, which you already kind of mentioned? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound, okay. So when you, when people say they're an atheist, what, and I don't want to generalize, so mm-hmm. I don't mean to say all atheists, but the, the least, or at least the ones I encounter, mm-hmm. Uh, they're very steadfast in that there is no such thing as God. There's no such thing as right. anything. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think you can take an absolute position like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson had the best answer. I, I don't remember what podcast it was, but they said to him, "Are you an atheist?" And he says, "You know, I'm not. I'm not an ist because an ist implies you, you've taken an absolute position." Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I'm a scientist. I keep an open mind. You know, I, I work with the information that I have, and I, that's sort of my approach to things. Mm. You know, I, I keep a very open mind about what there is out there and what what could be out there, and I don't dismiss anything because who really knows? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, was that? I I'm trying to remember if that was waking up or Nerdist. <laughs> It must. Be, I I think it was Nerdist because I listen to a lot of Nerdist. <laughs> uh, but don't don't hold me to that. But yeah, I think he has the best answer. So, I mean, look, I, you know, in my family, it's a it it is a big deal. You know, we when uh, when a loved one passes away in the Jewish religion, you you light a candle for them on the day that they pass. Mm. Uh, you know, like so that's something my family does. Um, so you know, I I think that sort of thing is wonderful. Yeah. You know, I, I don't dismiss that at all. I think that that's a great thing. I, you know, do I know if it means anything? I don't. Um, mm-hmm. Like, so to me, I, I kind of want to take back the word atheist. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I want to take it back to just mean I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's my only firm position is I don't know. And some people will go, oh, well, that's agnostic. But even agnostic, I think, is, is kind of like a cute twist like i think agnosticism became a cute nickname because atheism atheism developed a bad connotation right and i'll give you a good example like we've seen that throughout history uh because in america in the 19 in the 1910s we we developed propaganda we created it yeah uh that's what we used to get us into world war one um so (laughs) everyone was cool with the word propaganda until the nazis started using it yeah yeah, once we saw what the Nazis were doing, we're like, oh, uh, we're in public relations. Yes. <laughs> like, we're, not, we're not in propaganda. We're in public. It's the same thing. <laughs> and so that's kind of my my general take on like agnosticism. Is, is it's just atheism with like a more cuter yeah, yeah. Like, connotation to it. <laughs> um, but like you mentioned, uh, you do uh, really – enjoy or, or like aspects of spirituality so in, oh, sure. in what ways are you a spiritual person so uh i am a big fan of alan watts uh, okay and i don't know how to describe alan like so it's you know what's crazy is that he's one of those people that uh generally generationally like you and i shouldn't know who he is mm. but if you say alan watts to like a baby boomer <laughs> yeah, the, the boomers all know who he is because mm-hmm. he came out of the 60s and 70s. He, he described himself as like a stand up philosopher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what he did was he took a lot of um, Hindu and Buddhist beliefs uh, and introduced them to Americans mm-hmm. in a way that was 
that was funny and accessible and also very thought provoking. Mm. Uh, and so that's that's sort of what I would gravitate to. You know, I was reading an interview in The Hollywood Reporter where where Jim Carrey is saying, well, there is no me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like none of this, none of this matters. There is no me, which is a very which is a very Buddhist thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, it's one conscious, uh, one collective consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. <laughs> uh, there is no me. So, mm. I, you know, when he says it, he kind of. That's what he's talking about, and I'm fascinated by that sort of thing. Like, I, I kind of wonder if, if that's the case, because we, you know, even the most ardent evolutionary biologist, if you read the book uh, *Sapiens* and then *Homo Deus*, which is a sequel to *Sapiens*, hmm. uh, I can't remember the name of the author off the, off the top of my head, but it's the same author. Uh, and he, you know, he talks about this. This is an evolutionary biologist. It's kind of like, yeah, we have no explanation for your consciousness mm -hmm. like we, we can't we don't know like yeah. why you why we know why you have certain impulses yeah uh we know that those impulses are derived from a chemical reaction in your brain mm -hmm. uh because we've proven that we can change it but we have no idea why it's there yeah uh so i you know i do look at a lot of the things that alan watts talks about uh in buddhism and uh and from the hindu religion that i that kind of answer those questions. And that's sort of what I would say. I, I kind of go towards. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there a way yeah. of being spiritual without being religious? Yeah, I think so. Um, cause to me to be spiritual just means you're accepting of things that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just keeping that open minds. Um, my, you know, after my grandmother died, there was a squirrel that hung out around the house Hmm. Uh, and it just kept bothering my my grandfather and my sister, mm -hmm. uh, and they were convinced that the squirrel was my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so that that sounds crazy, but in the Jewish religion, there is this among some people anyway. There's a belief that uh, after you die, you've got like 30 days of just hanging out <laughs> before like you go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so who's to say? You know, can you can you prove beyond a reason right yeah. that that squirrel is not? your grandmother that, you know, that, that's out there <laughs> trying to, to uh, send you a signal. And we've seen that throughout human history. Yeah. Uh, throughout, so uh, there's a book called the hero of a thousand faces or the hero mm. of a thousand faces yeah. by Joseph Campbell, which is a really difficult to read book. <laughs> uh, so I don't like recommend it to people unless you're like really into folklore. <laughs> uh, but what he points out is that humans, regardless of where you, where we came from, we've all been telling the same story over right. and over and over again. And the same story has all of these different aspects and all of those stories mm. have a spiritual aspect. So, um, can you really say that there's nothing to that? And the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sort of accompanied with spirituality and religion comes the sense of morality. And so being, a, a spiritual atheist, of uh, how do you, uh, where does your morality come from? Uh, so in the past 200 years, and this is something that uh, they talk about in Homo Deus, which I do actually recommend. <laughs> do <you laughs> people read that? That's, that's a good read. Uh, he talks about the rise of humanism mm. and the, you know, like not everything has been good <laughs> that's come out of humanism. <laughs> uh, you know, like the Nazis are an extreme uh, you know, if you take humanism to an extreme end, you get like totalitarian, totalitarianism. Right. Uh, but if you take humanism to the other extreme, you get um, not quite Buddhism, but you kind of get like this almost hippie like, hey, we're just humans. We've all decided to take care of each other. So mm -hmm. that's our uh, that's our moral center. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a joke in a national story of minor significance. Uh, where you open up the cover and I like I have these different like tips for life. Mm. And so uh, it says, don't be evil. And it says tip number one, uh, don't be a dick. <laughs> and so that's sort of like my guiding principle. Yeah. Uh, is don't be a dick. Like, yeah. Don't, uh, Thomas Jefferson has had this belief of as long as you're not picking my pocket or breaking my leg, I support whatever it is that you want to believe and do. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just, you know, just that's a very humanist thing. Like, that's very, mm -hmm. as long as you're not bothering anyone, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Just just don't hurt anyone. And right. that's, uh, that's sort of my, my moral compass is, you know, don't, don't be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, and not being a jerk is kind of associated with uh, politics nowadays, right. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so, how do we reduce the political divide that has appeared nowadays? So, I have good, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> Uh, depending on how you interpret the, the bad news, uh, we could decide if there's good news or not in there. Mm. Uh, the bad news is that political divide has always been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has always been there. Like if you study, so I at one point uh, was going for my PhD in American history. Uh, I will be going for it again. In fact, I have to go and retake the GRE, mm. uh, which mm-hmm. sucks. Uh, but I will be going. So I I, I mentioned that to kind of I like. I don't, I don't want you to think I'm pulling this out of my butt. Sure. Like I, I do a lot of reading involving American history because that's always been my passion. And so mm. the divide has always been there. It's, it's always been about, you know, can I drive a wedge in this group over fear of the other? And I'll give you a good example of that. Mm. Uh, Abe Lincoln, a lot of people don't know this, funded a German language paper mm. in Illinois. Like he was technically the owner. Mm-hmm. of that paper uh, because he knew how important it was to get the German immigrants that were coming to Illinois uh, to to take part in the new, at the time, the new Republican Party hmm. uh, because he knew the division was so, like, so a lot of people don't realize this. The, the Republicans of today are not the Republicans of Abraham, right. Abraham Lincoln, no matter what they want you to think. Uh, the Republicans <laughs> of Abraham Lincoln came from a split between the Whigs and the Democrats. And the Democrats mm. were pro-slavery or they didn't want to end slavery. It wasn't that they liked it to some respects, depending on what part of the country they were from. They mm. just didn't want to disrupt what was happening because it was bad for business. Mm. Uh, so th- you had those Democrats. And then you had the Whigs that were kind of like, yeah, the slavery thing is bad, but maybe we just limit it. Or, you know, or maybe we just sort of what if we try this and then we can stop it that way? Or or what if we don't stop it? And what if we just let it go away gradually? (laughs) And so the Republicans were kind of like, no, if you work a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, Mm -hmm. that's, that was the Republican motto. That's what they built the party around. They said, you know, slavery is bad. This is something that needs to, needs to go away. And sure. They, they, uh, they were not abolitionists right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Uh, To be clear, like the early Republicans were kind of like, okay, I, we think that we could start to chip away at this if we do X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because of how divided the country was, Lincoln knew he needed he needed the support of everyone he could possibly get. Mm-hmm. And that never changed. Like, we had the know-nothings uh, who were anti-immigrant. And that fact, if you were not a wasp, they were anti-you. I think people forget <laughs> that. Like, if you were not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you were not American. And mm-hmm. they did, did not want you. And... Uh, even when my uh, ancestors were coming here in the early 1910s, you know, uh, coming off the boats, uh, people did not want those dirty Jews. You know, like they, they, <laughs> right. There was a lot of anti-Semitism. And so I, it's a long way of saying we, we've always had fractured politics in the United States, yeah. uh, it's partly because the country is so big, partly because uh, of the issue of slavery. And we never quite dealt with the ramifications of it. Hmm. Uh, in fact, a lot of the issues that you see today is just that what happened was we won the civil war, but then we shit the bed. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no other way to describe it. Like <laughs> anyone who has studied reconstruction and, mm-hmm. uh, Andrew Johnson will tell you, yeah, we messed up. And because we messed up so badly and empowered the South, we allowed for this, this, uh, the major division to never quite go away. So mm. this is a really long way of saying, you know, if you're bummed out about the politics of Trump or you're bummed out <laughs> about the politics of the Republicans today, just keep in mind that this is not a new thing. Sure. Um, so the good news is because it's not a new thing, we can take a step back and go, hey, we had some really bad presidents, but you know what we had right after that? <laughs> you know, out of, out of Hoover, we got the New Deal. Mm. And we forgot that. And out of you know, Eisenhower, we, we had Kennedy and then Johnson with, you know, for putting Vietnam aside for a second, <laughs> uh, who had the great society mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, the, the equal equal rights law. And so every time we've had a, a like yeah, George W. Bush, we mm-hmm. had, you know, Barack Obama. So yeah. we, we have always this country has always been one step forward, two steps back, one step, one step forward. <laughs> Uh, the important thing is is to not forget that and and to get cynical and then not vote. 
Mm-hmm. Because if you don't vote and you don't get involved, that step forward might not happen as fast as you want it to. Right. Like it, it will happen. We are, we already see the correction coming. Like you can look at uh, Ocasio Cortez, mm-hmm. and she's like definitely the harbinger of uh, the next step forward, right. which is very which is very exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unless we keep pushing, then that step doesn't happen. So I, I think that that's what the good news is. The good news is. As bad as Trump is, as bad as it is now with the Republican Party, we will take a step forward after yeah. this. Yeah. Um, two sort of straightforward qu- straightforward questions that I sort of forgot to add sure. near yeah. the end of the, the spiritual part. Uh, so, first of all, uh, God question mark, or rather, what is your definition of God? I think it's something that, that's beyond the realm of human knowledge. I, I don't think as a species that we should be so arrogant to assume that we know everything, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's sort of my, I, you know, I was a big fan of Futurama and there's an episode <laughs> where Bender gets, Bender gets lost in space yeah, and he encounters what he thinks is God, mm-hmm. uh, and, but he never really gets a, de- a definitive answer. <laughs> so, so what? it's just like this crab nebula that's talking to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think we have no idea of what's actually out there. Yeah, and um, I think that's wonderful. I think that's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> because look at all this. St- look at all the stuff that we didn't know a hundred years ago that we know today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think about all the stuff that we're going to know a hundred years from now that we don't know today. Right. Uh, yeah. So there could very well could be something out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there very well could be that we we were life on Mars. Something got wiped out, and we were bacteria that hitched a ride on the comet. Sure. <laughs> you know, like that. We don't know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have theories, which I think is great. And so uh, it's definitely a question mark for me. Like, you know, I don't again, like I, I, I don't want people to think that all atheists are like this, these adamant, sure. uh, ruthless, you know, I dig in my feet in the sand and not change their position. I just mm-hmm. take the position of I, I don't know. So I only work with what I have and what I know. Right. <laughs> Um, and then the other one is a uh, free will question mark. Oh, um, I change my opinion on this every day. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, it really depends on when, when you catch me. Uh, <laughs> I would very much like to believe that free will is a thing. Um, if, if you are an ardent Buddhist uh, and you believe that everything, it, it's all one conscious experiencing itself subjectively, uh, <laughs> then you definitely don't believe in free will mm-hmm. uh, because you're just kind of going along for the ride. You know? Right. Like, um, if you are an ardent evolutionary biologist, you're also not a big believer in free will mm-hmm. because you'll say uh, because of the biochemical reaction in your brain, even though we don't know why your, your consciousness exists, <laughs> we, uh, we have like, we, we have, empirical evidence to, to show right. you why your cat is so cute. <laughs> you know, like, I could show you that the cat has evolved over time to become increasingly cuter so that we will take care of it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, it really depends on when you catch me. I, I'd like to believe that there's something like that, but I, uh, you know, on most days I, I probably lean against it. <laughs> um, so only, I guess two more questions. Um, uh, what makes you happy? Oh, um, well, I almost died a few years ago. Okay. Uh, and so everything, <laughs> <laughs> everything is the honest answer to that. Um, I just enjoy everything. And I know mm. that that sounds kind of like uh, very vague, but and that, it's sort, that's just sort of how it is. Like, I, you know, it could be a car commercial <laughs> that was just <laughs> funny. Uh, that I could really enjoy, or it could be a good book, or it could be a good conversation, or it could, it could be a good pro wrestling match, um, or it could just be um, that someone was wearing a really pretty dress that day, <laughs> uh, and that, you know, or someone was beautiful. Uh, you know, like it, it's honestly everything. Because um, I think the thing you find out when you almost die is, oh crap, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> this is this could all be over in like a second. Right. Uh, so I am just going to take a step back and chill and uh, enjoy everything that I encounter. Yeah. Um, I don't think I can let you just skate by and say that you almost died and not <laughs> ask about it. So sure. <laughs> how did uh, you almost die? So I had, um, so I have a condition now, but I had something before called mitral valve prolapse uh, that was really severe. 
Uh, we just had no idea how bad it was. And it got to the point where I was out in Wales giving this presentation and I had like a hundred degree temperature, you know, a hundred plus degree temperature. Mm. I had chills. I like almost fainted. I did the presentation and I nailed it. <laughs> I, I like that. I, the show I must go it. on. That's right. The show must go on. Uh, <laughs> and then I like passed out for 24 hours. Uh, I then had like this really bad cough. And then um, I guess what was happening was I was experiencing the early signs of heart failure. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I came back, I, I made that flight back, which was hell. Uh, from, the, from the United Kingdom <laughs> to New York and then rushed in to see the heart doctor. And he's like, yeah, you got to go and get this fixed right now. Yeah. So I went in for heart surgery. And it's supposed to be a pretty routine surgery. Uh, you know, as routine as, as, routine heart, as surgery. heart surgeries can be. Yeah. Like if you, I mean, like the, the reassuring thing is if any of you ever develop something with your heart, there's really good news. Uh, hmm. by 2020, most of those procedures will be over in like an hour huh. and you can probably go home the same day. Like my, so my procedure had everything gone correctly. It would have been like a same day procedure. They would have gone up through the leg, fixed the valve. And I would have been done. Hmm. Uh, so they really made great strides with heart surgery. The problem is if, if shit goes wrong, <laughs> uh, then they've got to open you up and really get in there and do right. all the stuff. Yeah. That, so they went in there and did it and, um, Oh, it almost didn't work, but they got it to work and then closed me back up. And then between surgeries, I had, I had a heart attack um, mm. and then I flatlined and almost died. Yeah. So they had to revive me with the shock paddles and then rushed me back in for uh, an emergency surgery. So that's, yeah, that's the long and short of it. Yeah. And so when you come out of something like that, you know, you definitely have a different attitude about things. Yeah. Um, do you remember any of it? No. Um, so the funny thing was I, um, I remember going into the surgery, mm -hmm. uh, and counting back from 100 or whatever it was. And then yeah, I woke yeah. up and then, uh, I didn't realize I was in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I just assumed that I was in like the waiting area or whatever sure. it was. Uh, cause I, you know, I wasn't really aware of my surroundings. And then on the board, she was, uh, the nurse was writing the date and she wrote, um, she wrote like July. So I went in July 13th and she wrote like July 15th. Oh, it's, I was like, oh, that your, is it what your date is wrong? And she's like, what are you talking about? I was like, it's, it's, it's the 13th. Like it's the night of the 13th. Right. She's like, no, you've been out for almost a day. <laughs> uh, oh, so, um, I don't remember being shocked. I do remember the after effects of being hit with the shock panels, <laughs> uh, which is why, which is why I don't remember. Like, cause if you get hit with those things, it like zaps your, right. It, it zaps your memory a your bit. Brain so is why, electricity. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, you know, one of the good, one of the plus sides of getting shock paddled, right. Uh, <laughs> is, is not remembering a heart attack and almost dying. So yeah. So that's the, uh, that's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you can still be around to make people smile and, uh, enjoy things um, okay. <laughs> uh my last question uh is cake or pie um uh, right now i'm definitely in a pie phase okay <laughs> uh, yeah i am definitely like a cherry pie apple pie i wrote a piece called pie phase <laughs> Did you? Really? that's beautiful uh, i would like to read that so please send, send oh that. no it's a it's a musical <laughs> piece so <laughs> oh, no, I, I would like to listen to it so please send. Um, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely in the pie phase. <laughs> um, yeah, well score another one for, uh, pie. Uh, my fiance and I are, uh, <laughs> we have sort of a, a funny argument about cake or pie. I'm pie and she's cake. And so nice. I'm asking every guest cake or pie so that we can keep track of the statistics, <laughs> uh, so just, far, just, it's more pie. <laughs> just, be, just be careful, because if you if you win, uh, <laughs> your your partner will not be happy. <laughs> um, it's not about winning; it's more about the fun, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, I, so I was married, uh, and so I always remember uh, you always you, know, you always pick your battles. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, BJ, thank you so much for doing this with me. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Where can we find all of you and your things? 
Yeah, it's it's all at bjmendelson.com. Uh, I have my presentations are up on there. Uh, if you want a free copy of Social Media is Bullshit, there's a, there's a free PDF on the contact page. Uh, if you, my comics are like a dollar, so hopefully <laughs> that, that's not asking too much. But it's all it's all at bjmendelson.com. That's awesome. Um, I will be recording another podcast immediately after this, but I still got to end the podcast formally. So uh, once again, I'm Santiago Ramones. You are... DJ Mendelssohn. Yes, that is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was looking yeah. out the window. <laughs> um, I, uh, oh yeah, you can find all the things on my, all of my things on my website, SantiagoRamones.com, similar to how BJ Mendelssohn has his stuff. Um, I make music, which you can uh, download a demo of my songs with words, uh, but there's also some composery stuff that is uh, linked onto my SoundCloud. Uh, and so you can, pay money for that demo or not pay any money for that demo um and you can also listen to this podcast either through my website through apple podcasts on youtube or on stitcher uh and on all of those things you can comment and leave reviews and let me know what you think uh and if there are question suggestions or guest suggestions uh just let me know anything about the podcast um I always end my podcast with my three things. Those three things shape my life philosophy. Those three things are love never fails. It's going to be okay. I might be wrong. I like that. You cover your bases.